Uh, hey, go and take your Bibles, turn in, turn on your Bibles to the book of James. We've been in the book of James now. This is the third week. And uh, man, loving it. Uh, the first week we talked about kind of a paradoxical thought, and that is how to have joy in the midst of trials. Uh, joy in the junk, it's kind of hard uh, to find joy in the midst of difficult times and trials and transitions and difficulties. But that was the challenge of the first week in James chapter 1. Second week, we moved from trials we fall into and moved into temptations we often jump into. There's a major distinction there. Oftentimes, uh, trials aren't our fault, but temptation or falling into temptation is usually pretty intentional. And so that was kind of where we were last Sunday. Today, we're moving into this idea of how can we develop a lifestyle of moving from hearing to doing and not just being somebody who, um, who may say some things that we heard but actually live it out in our lives every day because that's really what following Jesus is all about. We can say we're a Christian, but to be honest, if it doesn't change our actions, we're just, uh, we're just uh, really uh, making a claim that there's no evidence for and so James confronts us today, and here's the thing. Talking about doing and hearing, we could easily just kind of say, man, I've heard this a hundred times, or man, I, I totally get it. I don't want to be a hypocrite, and so I'm with you, Wayne. Don't want to just be a hearer of the word. I want to be a doer. And we might say, you know, I, I don't do this thing. I don't do that thing. I'm not an adulterer. I, I'm not a thief, and so I'm not a murderer. So I'm being a doer of the word. You know, I'm not, I'm not you know, living an ungodly life. I'm, I'm trying to, to live for Jesus but the illustration that this whole idea is built around in James chapter 1 today, you're going to see is pretty confrontational and convicting to all of us. There's not a person in the room that can wiggle out of this because it's dealing specifically with how we talk and, and really how we respond to challenges and oftentimes in anger. And so it's not, it's not that this message is specifically about our speech and anger Really, the overarching idea is we want to be doers of the word. We don't just want to be hearers. But he uses this illustration that we're going to really find uncomfortable. And I think the reason he uses such a practical illustration is because we need to understand this is what doing the will of God is about. It's not about just the easy things that you're, you know, you're, you're checking the boxes and saying, I don't kill nobody, right? But it's really even about how are you living every day? You know, it's not about are you just coming to church on Sunday, but are you living for Jesus on Monday? You know, when something happens that, that isn't, uh, isn't like desirable, when bad things happen, how do you respond to that? When somebody says something to you or cuts you off in traffic, you know, how do you respond to that? You know, I, we jokingly say, I think Pat has a logo on his back window of his truck, but he said the good thing is the back window rolls down. Have you ever heard him say that? And so, like, if he, somebody cuts him off, he just rolls the window down. Then no matter, you know, whatever, he's not representing. But, uh, but the, I know sometimes we kind of we like that y'all just now getting that. You know, but anyway, so, sometimes we'd like to not necessarily have the accountability of our identity in Christ when we're faced with that, that confrontation. Let's go and pick up, turn in, turn on your Bibles, James 1, 19. Read with me, beginning verse 19, and let's hear the word, but not just hear it, but then leave by doing something about it. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear. Say quick to hear. Quick to hear. Slow to speak and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. I need to say that again. The anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. And when we talk about putting away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, we think that's like, again, stealing, adultery, all these other things. But it's really everything that's not pleasing to God in our lives. Instead, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently into, at his natural face in a mirror... For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. So it's like we look in a mirror and we forget that we're actually um, being made into the image of God. Luke verse 25, but the one who looks into the perfect law, that the law of liberty and per perseveres through it, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. 
If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, there's that illustration again, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. So here's a kind of a bottom line overarching idea. Visible faith is practicing what you preach. Visible faith is, is really walking what you talk. It's not just saying, I'm a Christian. I go to church. Um, it's not just like, it's not just telling everyone how they should live their lives. It's actually living the life God's called you to yourself. It's really making sure that you're making the main thing the main thing and you're not just being a fraud who says they're one thing and does something entirely different. So what does verse 22 mean when James says to be a doer of the word? To be a doer of the word really is going to be three things in particular we talk about today. All right, We're going to spend most of our time on, on the first, but then we're going to also deal with the second and third. But here, here's the first one. If you desire to be a doer of the word, you must control yourself. It really is about self-control. So how can we control ourselves? Uh, I think we'd all admit there's times when we're just out of control. And maybe we don't know how to rein ourselves in. Maybe better yet, how to rein the flesh in. How to rein our natural tendency in how to respond or how to speak or how to act. Um, how do we rein that in and please God instead of ourselves? How can we develop self-control? Verse 19 says that we should be quick to hear and slow to speak. These things are so practical. But listen, this is, this is really a, a pattern that we're going to see that will help us hear from God. We're going to be quick to hear, slow to speak, and then slow to anger. For the anger of a man does not produce the righteousness of God. So if the anger of man doesn't produce the righteousness of God, then I don't need to be angry. I need to try to avoid this anger from a flesh motivation and a desire just to respond and react to people who don't do what I wish they would do. So James goes straight for one of the greatest weaknesses we all have, and that, quite frankly, is our mouths. Our mouths are a vulnerable part of our body. I mean, we, we oftentimes worry about every other part, but we don't even think about the way we talk and the way we speak, the way we treat other people. The way we represent Jesus, honestly, is, is what we ought to think about most uh, when we think about our mouths. We likely all have heard this from time to time. My mom used to say it all the time, watch your mouth, young man. You ever heard that? I mean, watch your mouth. Watch your mouth. It used to go like, watch your mouth, Philip Wayne Bray. You know what I'm saying? When you hear your whole name, you know you're in real trouble. And my mom would be like, watch your mouth. And some of you need to not watch your mouth. You need to wash your mouth, right? <laughs> some some uh, may need to wash your mouth out uh, and watch your mouth. But, but the truth of the matter is we've heard those kind of things all of our lives. But, but in, in, in some sense, James is literally telling us the same thing. That, that it's important we hold ourselves accountable for what we say and how we say it. It matters, man. Hey, dad, mom, it matters how you speak to your children. Husband, it matters how you speak to your wife. And I'm talking to myself. Wives, it matters how you speak to your husband. Not only who's listening, but it matters even to God in relationship to how you're treating them. And so with all that as the background, it's a multifaceted application when it comes to this idea of self-control. And so I'm just going to give you three things uh, under the first point that James really tells us. First thing is this, listen up. If we're going to take some practical steps, we've got to listen up. Uh, we are surrounded by noise. And it may feel like that you're always listening up. But I don't mean listen up to everything. That's, that's kind of what we tend to do. We like open up our ears to every noise. And here's the thing, we're surrounded by a lot of noise. We're surrounded by a lot of opinions. We're surrounded by a lot of voices. Everybody wants a piece of you. Everybody's trying to influence you. Everybody's trying to get you to join their team. And we're in a culture that's contentious. Man, you think it was, I, mean, I used to feel like it was 10 years ago, 15 years. The fact of the matter is, we live in the most aggressive 
culture I have ever experienced. I mean, it's always, number one, everybody's aggressive, but number two, we're all defensive too. So what we do is we jump to conclusions. We assume the worst of everybody. And that, that honestly leads us to respond in a way that's not pleasing to God uh, many times. We, we react rather than respond. You know, we, we attack rather than consider and think about what that person may or may not have meant. And so when we react, we usually overreact. And then it honestly causes another problem. Uh, I mean, those of you who are married totally get this because we've done it a million times and I make the mistake. Even though, I mean, I try to help other people make, not make this mistake and I still make the mistake because I'm human. And so oftentimes when me and Amy are having a, a, a heated discussion, right, I will often just get to a point where I say something really dumb. Men, you ever been there? And the minute it comes out of my mouth, I'm like literally wishing I could reel that sucker back in. You know what I mean? And it's just too late. And then that, that can I just say, that foolish statement causes then a reaction from my wife. I, I tempt her in a way. And then sometimes, very rarely, she fails. And she'll, uh, she'll say something in response to me. And then I'll say something else. And we joke around in premarital counseling because we, we, like, we always say we have this like ammunition in the closet and we both pull it out. It's the same old hand grenades we've thrown a hundred times in every conversation we've had, right? And, and that, but that's what happens. We, we, like, we go back and forth. And that's in a marriage relationship. But let me just say, that's the culture we live in. We're constantly defensive. We're constantly reacting to what someone else said. And honestly, the devil eats our lunch. We lose our testimony, and we're ultimately useless to the kingdom of God. That's really what James is saying. You're, you're useless if you're not doing what I've told you to do, what God's told you to do. So Stephen Covey said this, Most people do not listen with the intent to understand. They listen with the intent to reply. And I think that's very true. Sometimes we're guilty of just while somebody's talking to us and we're listening, we're saying, what am I going to say back? What am I going to say back? What am I going to say back? We don't even listen. We don't actually process what they're saying. I'm afraid that our culture in a lot of ways, and I don't want to get off on a rabbit trail, but it's very true. Our culture has lost the ability to dialogue. We don't, we don't talk about things anymore. Um, you know, and I'm, I don't, uh, listen, I'm the first one to say that I believe that we're right. Christians are right about the gospel. But you know, there's, there's something to be said about a willingness to hear people who disagree with you. When you actually listen to people you disagree with, it, it earns the right to be heard. And the reason we aren't heard very much is because we never stop talking. And so believers need to learn sometimes it's, we need to listen up. We need to listen up, listen to other people, listen to their pain, listen to their hurts, and ultimately listen to God. I found that oftentimes I don't hear from God because I never shut my mouth. Listen up. That's the second thing, hush up. Listen up, then James says, hush up. He mentions a bridle. Uh, a bridle is a bit in the mouth of a horse, right? And the whole purpose of the bit is to guide, direct, and to control the horse. So the rider on the horse can, can direct the horse one way or another. And James is basically saying that a believer must have self-control over their words. None of us can say, well, God made me with this attitude, so I'm just, I'm just stuck with it. And so I'm just going to talk to people the way that I want to. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to be, I'm just an angry person. I'm sorry. You know, I, some people try to say, I just shoot it straight. That's kind of how I talk sometimes. I just tell the truth. But God didn't tell you to tell the truth of God like the devil, right? So it's, it's not one thing to, to speak the truth of God, but don't speak the truth of God in an attitude of the enemy. That's not godly. That's not being a doer of the word. It's proof you heard it. <laughs> so hearing the word and having the right information is not the whole deal. So hearing the word, having the right information, processing it, and then delivering it in a way that Christ himself would deliver it to an unbelieving world. That is being a doer of the word. That's, that's not just hearing a message, that's doing a mission. That's, that's fulfilling a mission as we represent Jesus. And so Edward Rayner said, Man's mouth, though it be but a little hole, 
will hold a world full of sin. It is not almost, uh, is it not almost as difficult to rule the tongue as to rule the world? I think that's powerful and very true. Let me give you two Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 27. I told you two weeks ago, uh, through James, bring a pen and paper or jot down notes. Proverbs 17, 27. He who has knowledge spares his words. And a man of understanding is of a calm spirit. Verse 28 is my favorite. Even a fool is counted wise when he holds his, speech, holds his peace. And what that basically means is, even if you're dumb, if you don't talk, nobody knows it. Amen? That's, that's pretty good. I mean, that's some good wise words right there. Even a fool is counted wise when he holds his peace. When he shuts his lips, he's considered perceptive. <laughs> I always think that's funnier than anybody else. But I, I think that's true. Some people, if you don't get that, you need to. Amen? That's just true. All right? Simple truth, though, we should think before we speak. There's so many times, man, and I'm, I'm the world's worst at this. We just need to, we need to rest. Sometimes we're so uncomfortable with silence, we don't hear from God. We're so uncomfortable with silence, we don't hear from other people. And, and we're just so quick to, to respond. But then one chapter over, Proverbs 18, Proverbs 18, 21, says death and life are in the power of the tongue. And I, the way I always try to think about this is like every word I say, even though it's super hard for me to grasp, every word I say is doing one of two things. It's either speaking healing or hurt. It's every word. Is gonna either, it's either going to bring life or death. That's what Proverbs is saying. And so which am I going to be? Am I going to be an agent of healing? Or am I going to be an agent of hurt? Am I going to be an agent of death or life? And I know we would all choose life and healing, sure. But honestly, we have the choice. It's really about self-control. Being able to bridle our tongue and not speak when we shouldn't speak, to listen up and to hush up sometimes. Um, you've heard, if you can't say something good, don't say anything at all. That's another thing my mom used to say. And while this is a good general challenge, it, it can be misleading. And so I want to make sure and be balanced before we move on. This is not to say Christians should never speak up. And so there are times where, in fact, there are a lot of times where we should stand up and say Truth is truth. We're not going to take this or we're not going to back up on that. We're going to stand on the word of God. But here's the thing where Christians totally get it wrong. I mean, the fact of the matter is we don't have to be angry to stand on the truth of God's word. I mean, in fact, a relationship with God and the forgiveness that he's given us, the grace that he's given us, it ought to produce in us such a gracious spirit. Even as we stand on truth, we should do so in the Spirit of God. If our hearts are, if Holy Spirit is reigning in our hearts, then we're not going to be malicious or vicious. We're actually going to be gracious and caring and compassionate to people who are still foolish, foolishly chasing after the things of this world. And so that helps us at least understand this whole idea. And that leads us to the third thing, not just listen up, hush up, but simmer down. Some of us just need to simmer down. James says we should be slow to anger, slow to anger. I mean, how many times right when you see something on the headline news or right when you see it come across your feed on social media, just, I mean, you just jump immediately to aggression and anger. Um, you may say, well, why should we even care about being angry, Wayne? There's some things we should be angry about. And I would say totally for sure in, in, the, in the righteous indignation of God that's full of holiness and righteousness, we should be absolutely angry at some things. So why should we care about anger? Because man's anger, it says, not God's anger, man's anger does not bring righteousness. Man's anger does not produce a righteous life that God demands for us. And so it's no excuse to be standing on the right side. That's not an excuse to be angry in your flesh. So consider the fruit of the Spirit. This is the Word of God. Galatians 5, here's the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness. This is proof the Holy Spirit's in your life. This is proof you're a follower of Jesus. Peace, long-suffering, kindness, godliness, faithfulness, 
Listen to this word. Oh, I hate it. Gentleness. Gentle. Self-control. Those are the fruits of the Spirit. Those are demonstrations that He's inside of you. Not anger. Not quick-temperedness. Not hurtful words. Those things are proof that you're a hearer and maybe not a doer. So I would argue that every single fruit of the Spirit actually speaks against anger and speaks against our quick-tempered responses oftentimes. Yet we all struggle with this issue. Every pastor on your staff, every, every staff member of our church struggles with this. Why? Because we're human beings. We're sinners who need grace. But here's the truth. The truth of the matter is we, we know the answer. We need to acknowledge it. And here's what we need to do today. We need to really apply this, not only in the area of our speech and anger, because these are just illustrations. It moves really to a broader subject of being a doer in every way. Whatever the word says, we want to be a doer of the word, not just a hearer only. Let me give you some overarching ideas. When we listen more and we speak less, we can then better hear God's voice and be more faithful doers of his word. I'm going to say it again. When we listen more and we speak less, we can then better hear God's voice and be more faithful doers of his word. And so our inability to hear God's voice does not mean he's not speaking. Best way for me to understand this is like if I'm watching a Braves game and the sound is turned up high because I'm going deaf and I'm, I'm listening to the game like, you know, full, full of volume and Amy's trying to talk to me. I desperately love Amy. I mean, I, there's no question in my heart. She's the most important person in my life. I care about what she's saying, but in the midst of bases loaded and before Ronald Acuna got hurt, I would have said, Ronald Acuna up to bat. We we're down by three. I mean, I'm watching the TV and I'm like totally focused on that, but I want you to hear this. Listen, so if Amy's speaking and I'm not listening to her, but I'm watching the game where I'm going, yeah, uh-huh, 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 yeah, yeah, uh-huh. See, so that's how we do God. What happens is I'm literally saying to my wife, the game is more important than you. The game is more important than you. I have all this noise. I have multitude of voices. And I'm, gonna, I'm focused on the game. I'm trying to hear you on the side. So what I've had to learn over the years is I have to literally mute the game, regardless of what game it is. I have to mute the game, or sometimes I've literally had to just turn the TV off until I've listened to my wife. Now, what, what does that do? Well, number one, it speaks volumes to the one who's speaking to you, and it says, I value what you're about to say. I value your voice more than the television, all right? Second thing it does, it actually practically means I'm hearing what she's saying, which is amazing. And in, in the whole conversation with God, this is, I hope you're getting this, this is so simple, but... I mean, you're surrounded by a million distractions, and they're loud. The noise is loud. you got friends telling you a hundred things. you got multitudes of influences, podcasts. you got all kind of teachers and friends at school. you got a culture filling you full of trash. I'm just, I'm just here to tell you, okay? The songs we listen to oftentimes, I'm not asking you to be, I'm not being legalistic and say, don't listen to anything but Christian music. But I was one telling you, sometimes the, the stuff you listen to is trash. Y'all all right? And I mean, like, you can't, you can't ignore that if you expose yourself to the voices of the world, that somehow you're just going to be exempt. You know, I'm, pro, I'm, I'm exempt from it. No, that stuff's going to influence you. The movies you watch, the stuff you watch, it's going to influence you. And so the, the, the problem is, with all of this other noise, it's never a question, is God speaking to you? I want you to hear, listen, I just can't hear God. I just don't know what he wants me to do. I'm just seeking the Lord, just looking for a word from God. You've got one already, all right? So the problem is not that God's not speaking. The problem is there is a multitude of voices in your life. And you have prioritized all these other voices. And for some people, honestly, it's Fox News or CNN. For some people, it's Taylor Swift, all right? Whatever. Oh, did you hear what Taylor Swift said about this? No, I don't. I don't give a rip what Taylor Swift says. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Now, hey, like, 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 that's not, I, I shouldn't have said that. I also, let me think of somebody else. Uh, I don't give a rip what Leonard Skinner says. All right, that's mine. All right, so uh, that way nobody go home thinking, hey, just preacher preached on Taylor Swift. I didn't preach on Taylor Swift. I'm just trying to say, listen, I'm just trying to say there, there's so many things, so many voices. There's so many opinions 
Never value any voice over the voice of God. Never. And if someone in your life is telling you something that contradicts what God has said, they are wrong. They're wrong. They are a liar, and the influence that they are making on your life is not helpful. It's actually contradictory to what God wants to do in your life. Now, I'm not telling you to get legalistic. I'm telling you to be smart. Be smart. Be wise in how much you allow things to influence you because if you're not careful, what's going to happen is those influences will overwhelm you to where you can't hear the voice of God. So just make sure as, as, you're, as you're walking through all of these things to control yourself. you got to have con- self-control is such an important factor. But then beyond self-control, it really is the next step, turning from sin. We've got to turn from sin. We've got to make sure that this is not just some kind of, uh, this, some kind of like one-time deal. I turn from sin to Jesus, I'm saved. But here's the thing, it's a daily dying. So sanctification is like literally like waking up every day and saying, I'm going to live for Jesus. No matter what voice I hear, I'm listening to his most. I'm prioritizing the voice of God in my life. So that no matter what anybody else says, I know he is true. I know whatever he's saying in his word is what I'm following. I trust him. I trust him more than anything else. And so that that turning, that initial turning from sin and self, turning to Jesus, what it does is it gives us the power to control ourselves. And then as we have self-control, it's almost like this, this cycle of strength. Because the more we have control of ourselves, the more we keep turning to Jesus every day. And so I'm in sanctification The power of God in my life helps me even when I hear the things. Even if I do listen to something that is is contrary to God, I recognize truth for what it is. And I recognize fallacy and error for what it is. And the maturity in me stands up. And I recognize that God's voice is speaking clearly. And sometimes God will tell me and you, hey, avoid those things. Avoid this thing because that's not helpful for you. Other times we just have to be wise and make sure that we're not just hearing the word, but we're doing it. We're living it out every day of our lives. There's always a tendency. Listen, I'm telling you, in my age, I've, 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 I've battled this for decades, as has many people in this room. There's a tendency in religion to become super legalistic. And I'm guarded against legalism. I want you to hear this big time. I'm not, I'm not trying to to throw darts at anybody and say, you need to do this, don't do that, you need to stop doing this. Here's what I'm telling you. I'm telling you to hear the voice of God and it'll be clear what you need to do and not do. Listen for God's voice. And, and, and you're gonna hear his voice primarily from his word. And if his word tells us to do something, then it really is no debate. We turn from sin. Verse 21, therefore, put away all filthiness. And, and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word. Here's the problem. We're planting a lot of things in our hearts. And I'm afraid the word is the least of them. And the reason we can't receive the implanted word is because we haven't put away the things that are in its way. So we've got to put away the junk. We've got to get rid of stuff that we have elevated to the position of God in our lives. We've got, to, we've got to weed through the voices that are less important. And we've got to make sure that we implant the word of God so that we're hearing the voice of God primarily in our heart, in our life. Ephesians 4, says, Put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So many passages in the New Testament speak to the same thing. Hebrews 12, 1 says, uh, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us. Um, Romans 13, 12, cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. See, the problem is we're not losing the right things. Oftentimes we, we put off the people of God. We put off the word of God. We put off following Jesus And we put on hearing the other influences and the other voices. They easily become our priority. They easily become the greatest influences in our life. And what happens inevitably is that the other things fall by the wayside, which honestly would be pleasing to God. 
And so I, I think about it like this. Some of this, this language of, of put off this, cast off that. In, in the New Testament, the language has this connotation or idea of like clothing, which I know could make us feel really uncomfortable for a second. But here's what Paul's trying to say. Man, take off the old garments and put on the new ones. Constantly. All these verses, that's the language in the Greek. Is this idea of like change clothes already. And I think... From a righteous perspective, and how do we live for Jesus? How do we be doers and not just hearers only? Here's what it would translate to. If you think about it like this, a 20-year-old woman should not be wearing toddler pajamas, right? A 40-year-old man, a 15-year-old man for, for that um, point. Uh, we don't wear baby clothes anymore. Why? Because... Our body has grown, and we no longer fit in those garments. This is what James is trying to say, and really Paul in all the other passages I quoted, is that for a Christian to go back and speak the way that he did before he met Jesus or have the anger that he had even when he was an unbeliever, or even for us to really minimize the voice of God and, and elevate the voices that are contrary to God, what we're really doing is we're like an adult sleeping in toddler pajamas. And that's insane. I mean, we couldn't even fit them on our calf, right? It would just be like weird. Um, and it's, it's pretty weird for a person who says they love Jesus not to live like it. To say, oh, Jesus is Lord. To sing, Holy Spirit, have your way. But to live like the only way we care about is ours? See, that's, that's like a 20-year-old putting on toddler pajamas. And so it's, it's not about, when we hear turn from sin, we're like usually thinking, don't be a killer, you know? Jesus is saying, live like you love me. Live like I'm, like I'm your greatest desire. Live like I matter more than anyone else in your life. That's when someone becomes, shifts from being a hearer of the word and actually becomes a doer of the word. A little statement here. We must make room for the word to take root in our lives. We've got to make room in our heart and our life for the word of God to take root in our lives. And listen, you can't receive all that God has to give you until you've laid down all that he's delivered you from. And so many times we've been delivered from addictions, distractions, pain, suffering, but we crawl back to it. We crawl back to it. We can't have room for all that God wants to give us until we've laid down all that he's delivered us from. The final thing I want you to notice we said control yourself, turn from sin. But finally, if you desire to be a doer of the word, it's simple. You, you must live on mission. And this is what so many of our teenagers are about to go do. They're about to go on a mission trip. But here's the deal. Living on mission is more than six days, guys. Living on mission is like a decision. Here's what could happen this week with 120 of y'all, 115 of y'all, plus the adults that are going. This really could be, and for me it always was this way. You go on a mission trip, it's almost like you, you, you set aside things that would distract you. And you're, you're only able to focus on what God is saying, His voice. And when you do that, it's crazy how close you get to God. Like in just six, five days, it was like it's amazing. I want you to think about it this week when you're actually talking to your community groups, when you're talking to one another and you're growing in your faith and you're getting passionate about the Lord. I want you to think about what it's like to, to pull aside and to lay aside to cast off the things that distract us from God. Because when he is the only voice we hear, whew, he's loud. And he wrecks us, man. He totally takes control of our lives. And so living on mission is far more than going on a mission trip. But God can use a mission trip to begin that desire to plant his word in the place of all of the other things that have distracted us. Verse 27, James uses a final illustration I want to share with you. He says, religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father, is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction 
and to keep oneself un, unstained from the world. So this is really following Jesus. It's not a man-made religion. And this is an illustration. It's not an exhaustive list because he could have just as easily said a pure and undefiled religion is caring about lost people and sharing your faith. This is an example. He's trying to say, look, when we really know Jesus, it impacts our actions. When we've heard the word and it's taken root, then we're going to do something about it. And so I want to give you just one little example. Our ministry um, called Forever Loved used to be Forever Family, if you remember that. Forever Loved is a ministry to foster care and adoption uh, families. And you may be here today and you may be like, man, I, we're, we're an adoptive family or, or hey, we're, we're a, a family that uh, ministers in foster care system. And, and man, you're a vital part of our church. And I, I want to ask you, if you'd scan that QR code, we want to connect you to this ministry. And it's easy for you just to fill this information out and get connected. But you may not be an adoptive or foster family, but you would like to bless those families. You'd like to care for those families and support those families. Also, scan that QR code. It's a way that you can, you can become engaged and involved in that part of our ministry. And I want to just give that as an application and kind of an opportunity to build a bridge to this ministry since we read a passage that's so relevant to it. But I want you to understand that's just one example of a million of how God moves us from hearing his word to doing his word. From hearing a message to doing his mission. So when we truly surrender to his calling, we see the world through his eyes. We, we understand that the mission becomes greater than our preferences, our, our, our heart's desire, our flesh longing, that his voice becomes louder than the voices of all the idols we have and all of the, the people, the celebrities and the, the sports, the athletes that we lift up to pedestals. Listen, no one will ever be as big as God. And in our lives, we got to yield to that and recognize if I'm going to be a doer, I'm not going to be a hypocrite. I'm not going to be a fraud who calls himself a Christian but lives his life. Then Jesus has to be first. In everything that we do, we began to care about the things and the people that God cares about more than the things of this world when we become doers and not just hearers. So, today, my final challenge don't just hear the message, but do the work of the mission. This is what it means to follow Jesus. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your word. I know that, uh, man, so many times. Uh, we open the Bible and it just immediately confronts us. This is one of those passages where even when we're talking about the way we talk, God, the anger that sometimes rises up, that's just an illustration in this passage. But God, it's so convicting for me. I pray that you would help us hear your word by the power of your spirit and apply it to our hearts and lives. I pray we would not just be church members who listen to listen to preaching <laughs> but God you would help us be followers of Jesus who follow you literally every day we want to be like you we represent you and we don't want to be just hearers we want to be doers of your word that's our prayer God speak to us we pray change us by the power of your spirit in Jesus name amen let's stand together